Mal Michael was let go by Collingwood at 23 years of age. Three years later, he was a triple premiership player at Brisbane and the most respected fullback in the game. Welcome, Mel. Thanks, Mike. What happened to Collingwood? Uh, played five years there, 61 games. Um, in terms of value for money, I don't think um, they felt that they were getting their money's worth. Were they right? I think so, yeah. Were you a bit wild then? Were you, would you give yourself the term of scallywag or scoundrel or...? Um, probably rat-bagged. Rat-bagged, yeah. were you? But in, I look back on those days and um, I don't think that I was doing anything that most 23-year-olds 23 23 do these days, but um, it was a time when Collingwood were in a transition process of going from cellar dwellers to a new era under Mick Malthouse. So what sort of antics are we talking about here? Just normal pranks or was there problems that they were entitled to sort of say, listen, we, we can't tolerate this stuff? Yeah, probably just going out on a, on a weekend Yep, was, was probably the main thing. Beers? Beers, yeah. Maybe. Alcohol yeah. related um, incidents, things like that. Was that the start of the famous or the infamous Rat Pack at Collingwood? It could have been. That, I know that started after I left, but... Um, <laughs> well, Chris Tarrant was there at the time. OK. Yeah. Um, he was a mate of yours, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. I don't want to paint Taz as, as, as the head of this group, but, I mean, there were, were... Was Benny Johnson there then? I was there with Benny, yeah. yeah. He, he, my last year was his first year, mm -hmm. um, but it's a good Rat Pack. <laughs> <laughs> Became a very good Rat Pack. Yeah. You were swapped... You went to Brisbane and Jared Molloy went to Collingwood. Do you know who drove that? I actually don't know who drove it, um, because I, I do think that at the time, um, you know, post-trade, post people will say that Brisbane got the better trade, you know, the better deal out of it, but at the time, I, I, I think that if you look at the basic figures and the numbers and games played, I think Collingwood actually got the better deal. 2001 Grand Final, Brisbane beats Essendon, you're a Premiership player, a couple of days later you send a text message to Jared Malloy, mm -hmm. what did it say? It was very simple. It just said, thanks for this. I'm really? sorry, Jared. About that. <laughs> well, because the, the view outside was that you had sent a nasty message to him. But that's all it was. Thanks for this. Yeah, no, there was... It, look, it was a bit of tongue-in-cheek. And in hindsight, probably shouldn't have done it. But I did, and that's in the past. But um, yeah, there was certainly no malice in, the, um, in that text message. There's the medal that uh, prompted your excitement. Yeah. And rightly so. Yeah. yeah. Amazing to come so soon, isn't it? I mean, whatever, whatever the reason was that you left Collingwood, you were let go, and 12 months later you were a premiership player. Mm. We turned around so quickly. Um, got to Brisbane, got the body right. Um, I actually didn't train for three months when I got to Brisbane because I had to sort out my body. Um, and then just played in a team that was just so balanced across the park. The one thing I did notice when I got to Brisbane is that they did employ the best of everything, so the best doctors, best physios. Um, so like I said, I didn't train for three months. I spent the whole time in the physio room uh, until I got those things right. And then once I got those things right, um, I was actually able to play a lot of games. Did you think you'd landed at a better club when you got to Brisbane? Better, yes and no. I loved Collingwood. I loved the tradition of the of the place. Um, I remember turning up there as an 18 year old and you could feel the, mm. the history just dripping off the walls. Yes, it was old. Facilities were terrible. Um, Brisbane's facilities were so much better. Um, so from that point of view, Brisbane, lobbing up at Brisbane and playing in a better team with better facilities was great as a professional footballer, but in terms of playing in Melbourne for a big club, that's an experience you can't buy. What did you know about Collingwood? I mean, you, you, you were born in Papua New Guinea, moved to Queensland as a three-year-old, and have grown up there in a sort of a non-football state. Mm. What did you know about Collingwood? I just knew that they were just a big club. We used to get a lot of... Um, we used to get a lot of... AFL on TV up in, in Brisbane, so um, every time you'd see Collingwood play, there'd always be a big crowd. Um, great grandfather played there, played one game there, so there was a little bit of family history there. So to so to end up there and um, you know the famous black and white stripes mm -hmm. uh, was was pretty good. I think if if most kids couldn't get drafted to the club these days that they supported, I think Collingwood would almost be mm -hmm. the next best thing. Tell us about the PNG connection. Uh, your father was born in Melbourne, wasn't he? Correct. Yeah, he's a civil engineer by trade and back in those days when uh, most of them finished their education or their, their degrees, they'd be posted to the states and territories around the Pacific and he was posted to New Guinea. So he went there and stayed there 13 years and met my mother there and we moved to Brisbane in 1980. What does that uh, picture mean to you, that flag? 
Yeah, it's, um, it was a proud moment actually. That that was in the '97 um, grand final record. That one. So. Yeah, I was the first uh, PNG player to, to mm. play AFL, so it was a very proud moment. You were pretty physical, weren't you? you yeah. You enjoyed that. You were a big man. You liked uh, the physicality of, of the game. I did, yeah. Did you go looking for it, or was it just when the occasion arose? That... Uh, probably just when the occasion arose. I just felt that with the, the smaller players, um, if you had a chance to either um, assert some aggression <laughs> and fear, <laughs> yeah on them, um, it would then make them worry about not only what they what they were out there to do, but, you know, big mouths around the corner as well. <laughs> <laughs> What's your best hit, mate? What's the one that you're proudest of? I don't mean in terms of whacking someone, but were you, uh, in terms of uh, asserting your physicality, that you upended someone from the other team and had a big impact? Uh, it wasn't so much that I, I had cleaned someone up, but it was more the attack on the football um, and you know Vossi was really good at demonstrating that and showing the example but it was I think it was the 2004 um, the first final I'm not sure what that what they call the first final but we played St Kilda up at the Gabba and it was about sometime during the third quarter and the ball had bounced and it was bobbling around the, the 30 meter area and I've just attacked it and I had two tacklers come in on me and I've just gone straight through and the two of them have almost done the helicopter and mm. um, I, I look at that and that sort of, um, I think that was a, a good moment. I know my teammates really loved it because we yeah. got into the three quarter huddle and they, they were just, they were pumped to see it. And it was a pretty physical backline the Brisbane defence wasn't it? Yeah we, we had to be. Um, th th there was a lot of things about that Brisbane team where um, I wouldn't call it peer group pressure, but you just had to do it. If you didn't do it, you're out of the side. So, as well as it being a very balanced team, it was also very aggress aggressive and, um, and strong vocally. When the ball was in the ML coming towards you, you, the thing that we most remember, I think, of you was your timing with your punches. You, you didn't take the risk with the marks, did you? You just wanted to hit the pack, hit the contest and smash the ball. I did, yeah. I also wanted to try and take someone out on the way through. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, I know a lot of the players now are instructed to mark. Um, but I, I just feel that a lot of our attacking rebounds came from the spoil because yep. when you mark it now, you go to ground and then you get up and it becomes a slow transition out of, out of defence. With us, or with myself in particular, I'd, I'd spoil over uh, the crumbing forwards who were front and centre, so it automatically became an, uh, an attacking play. Mid-season 2001, Essendon's a juggernaut. Your coach, Lee Matthews, says, if it bleeds, you can kill it referring to the Bombers. Mm. Did you believe that at the time? Personally, I didn't believe it. Because at, at the time, we were really out of form. Uh, I think we were going into round nine. We were three wins and five losses. We'd had a, a really poor loss against Carlton at Princess Park, I think in round seven, and then we lost to Adelaide at home in round eight. And then we are coming up against the Bombers who'd lost one game in 30 starts. So. Mm. Um, the thing that, uh, that that group had in particular, we knew the quality of players we had, but we were just in terrible condition. And we what, what do you mean by that? You weren't what you weren't fit. You weren't. Uh, was it psychological or physical? I think it was a confidence uh, thing. We we were not bad at home. We were very poor away. Um, and it wasn't until we, we won that game and we had the self-belief. And I remember that that week, actually, Lee had put up all the players with their direct opponents and they and he went through it position by position. Can we win this position? We said, yes, we can. Can we, can Mel beat the Lloyd mm -hmm. uh, matchup? Yeah, he probably can. Can Johnson beat the Mark Johnson yep. matchup? Yeah, he can. And then we went through the list and we said, okay, we've got, we got 13, 14 wins here. Okay. Why can't we beat them? Smart psychology, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so we went out that, that night, we beat them, and then, then the run started from there. It was a great run, wasn't it? You, weren't, you were never the best team of the home and away series, were you, in your three premiership no. years? But it was just this ability, I presume, the talent in the team plus the coaching, that was able to get you to be at your best in September? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we never finished minor premier, and I think in 2003 we actually finished third. So, I mean, that, winning that grand final was was a feat in itself. The way we had to get there and do it. But um, yeah, there was a belief with the playing group. Um, you know, whatever people will say about Lee Matthews, he was the right man for the job. Yep. He had some he had some huge egos he had to deal with. He had some big personalities. 
and he had to make sure that we all played as a team. Did you once refer to him, refer to him as a dictator? I did, yeah. <laughs> did you mean that literally? I did, but he had to be. Mm. Lee had to be a very strong-willed character because he was he was coaching players now that are coaches themselves. Mm. And if you know you know what coaches are like, they are very strong-willed mm. men. So he had to be, and we and we needed someone like that to channel 22 guys into playing good football. Wide range of personalities, weren't there? Foss, the great captain, Acker, yes. slightly different, Daryl White, different again, you, yep. Brownie. It was an eclectic mix, wasn't it? Well, I think that's what made that team so good. It was, it was a, there was so many different uh, flavours in that side. Um, it wasn't just the run of the, Run of the mill, you know, production line footballers. And if you talk to supporters up in Brisbane, that's what they loved about us mm. as well. It was almost like they were coming and seeing a, a soap opera yeah. um, unfolding um, as part of their lives as well. You played junior footy with one Jason Ackermanis. Mm -hmm. Did his development through to AFL level surprise you? No, no. no he was an absolute star. I don't mean to in his ability to play the game, but just in, in the impact that he had. Uh, via his personality. No, nah, he was he was always like that as a young fella. Um, so he was very um, he, he liked to voice his opinion. So that didn't surprise me at all. What about the way that Jason left the footy club? Was it did, were you saddened by that? A little bit, yeah. I, I was always sad to to see someone who who'd done so much for a footy club leave. Um, unfortunately, it just happened the way it did. Self inflicted? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, Did he deserve better than that? I mean, I'm, I'm looking from the outside, so I don't yeah. know. But I loved Ackermanis, the footballer. D given the contribution and the impact that he made with the Brisbane Lions, did he deserve a bit of favourable treatment? I, I think that he... I think he, he did. I, I, I just felt that he he'd had, he had these media commitments that required him to give the scoop, I guess, or... Mm. Um, or to say something, yeah. Or to come yeah. up with something yeah. each week to be interesting. And um, I just felt that if, if that part hadn't have existed, Acker would be remembered as one of the greatest players. Of and he game. should be, shouldn't he? He should be, yeah. yeah. And, he, and he really should be in some, in some capacity still involved with football, but the clubs won't take that risk. I want to ask you about a couple of um, uh, notorious incidents from your on-field career. One was when you seemed tired of the situation and bored and you decided to kick a point for the opposition from 30 metres away. What drove you to that? Uh, it was a game against Melbourne at the Gabba. Um, we, we had a young team in that, that, at, at that, on that night. It was a game where um, we conceded two, uh, two goals on the goal line and back then you could just rush the ball. Mm. Um, and there were things that we used to do with our eyes shut when we were going through our successful periods and we had a lot of young kids in the side and they were trying to keep the ball alive. Um, so we ended up conceding two goals. So when I got the ball, I said, I'm going to show you how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Bit extreme, I know. <laughs> how far out were you, do you think? I was about 30, yeah. 35 metres. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll put it through for a point. But you kicked, but it was through the goals, wasn't it? Yeah, I kicked yeah. it through the goals, yeah. probably post high as well. Yeah. I yeah. remember Malcolm Bloke saying that's the most ridiculous thing he's ever seen on, yeah. on a football field. The other one, Mel, was the um, the tangle with Nick Revolt, mm. Brisbane St Kilda at the Gabba, the St Kilda captain with a broken collarbone. Retrospect, right or wrong thing to do? Wrong thing to do. Shouldn't have done it. Um, we just. We were just so driven, so driven to win and succeed at, at whatever cost. And at the time that might have seemed okay. Now, being a bit older and, and trying to play fair mm. and within the rules, um, I don't think it was a, a good thing to do. You're a coach now. Yeah. If one of your players did it, what would you say to him? I'd be disappointed. I'd just say that it's not in the spirit of the game and just not in the spirit of, of how we live anymore. There was massive fallout from that, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. Um, Do were you embarrassed by the, that? Yeah, I mean, it was, I remember at, in Brisbane, and like Brisbane didn't get much media, or much media at that time, but I was being hounded by the media. Like, mm. I, I felt like um, some of those celebrities being chased by paparazzi. <laughs> I, I had to literally go down to the, I had to get away and go to the Gold Coast for a few days Did you? to get away from it. Because yeah. of that action? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had people writing me letters, um, fans of St Kilda um, emailing and writing saying that they were not happy with what I'd done. Did you say anything to him? 
on the way in. Uh, when the collision occurred, I was saying I was. I was on my way in. I'd come from about 15 metres away. Yeah. I, I saw that he was in some discomfort, and I thought, well, you know, he was their best player. Mm. He had single-handedly that night got him back into the game mm. and actually put him in front. And I thought, he's, he's, he's a bit wounded. I'm just going to run at him, mm. and hopefully he won't be able to participate for the rest of the game. Were you first, or was Chris Scott first to get him? I was first. It, it looked later like as if it was almost like a couple of hyenas going at a wounded animal, mm -hmm. didn't it? Yeah, it looked terrible. Yeah, but at the time, like I said, it, that's what it took. We won the game. Mm. It, Nick going off the field helped us win that game. Mm. Did Lee have a view about it? He didn't say anything afterwards, but I, I think he would have been quietly happy. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been, oh, that's my horse. <laughs> did you, uh, have you crossed paths with Nick since then? I have. And did you say anything about it? Uh, I haven't. Um, but did he? No. No. And we're okay about it, um, the times that I have caught up with him, but we haven't actually spoken about that incident. My view is that you're entitled to feel miffed that you were never all Australian. Johnny Hay was all Australian in 2001. Matthew Pavlich was all Australian in 2002, and Matty Scarlett in three. Are you offended by the fact that you were never acknowledged in the team of the year? At the time, not so much. Um, probably post career, I, I felt a bit disappointed because um, I had a really, I had a really good block of, a, of four or five years where I was really at the peak of my powers. Um, I guess when you look back and the, the players that were selected, they, they seemed to, there always was one player that seemed to have a better season than what I did, so I might have been second on the list, but... Um, well, I don't think Pav had a better year at fullback than you did. You know, two, probably not. Um, but yeah, 2 was probably my best year that I played, and, and 4 was a very good year as well. Did you ever have a day out where you just wanted to chase the footy and get it and kick goals and do the things that most footballers yeah, want to do? Absolutely, I did. Um, but that was my role, to do that for the team. If, uh, whenever I didn't have a good day, um, inev inevitably we lost, um, because the buck always stopped with me at full, mm. full back. What's your single favourite grand final moment, premiership grand final moment? Uh, it would have been 2001. The um, first one? 2001, yeah. Look, I was happy just to get to the grand final. Uh, it sounds ridiculous because you want to get there and win it, but the fact that I was, we were in the grand final, I was playing on grand final day, you've, I'd always watch other teams do it and think, geez, I'd love to do that, mm -hmm. but never got the chance. And so I was happy just to get there. Um, as we mentioned before, we, we were playing against a team that was probably one of the best teams ever in Essendon. Um, but in the third quarter, it started to change the momentum. They led at half-time and then we, we took over and we went into three-quarter time just in front. But my favourite um, moment in my three premierships were, I, I can't remember the exact timing of the game, but it was when Luke Power swooped on a ball after a few chain of handballs and he kicked the goal from about 35 out. And I remember the, the cheer squad behind the goals. They all went up in unison. And we broke out to about a 24-point lead, and I thought, we got this. Mm -hmm. And I looked around, and we all knew we'd had it. And we just went for the kill after that. 2004, Mel, you were chasing history. First team since the late 20s to, uh, to win four in a row. You were in front at half-time, weren't you? Mm. Do you share the Lee Matthews view that the AFL almost conspired against you that year and played you late? and you had sort of one fewer sleeps up in Brisbane. Did that affect you, do you think, as a player? It, de it definitely hurt us. There's no question about that. We, we finished second and we had to play a prelim final in Melbourne against Geelong. At night? On the Saturday. So yep. Port had played on the Friday night, so they had the extra day, plus they're at home. Um, so but I think in, for grand final week, we had to be back here on the Wednesday. So we, we basically had three days to recover from that. Whether or not the AFL conspired um, for, for that to happen, they might have. I, I don't think it's good when you have a team that wins the Premiership four years in a row. It's probably not good for our competition. But at really? The top, yeah, I don't think it's good. I would like to have said that I saw the best team in 80 or 90 years had you won four in a row. Mm. And that's what you would have been. Yeah. So yeah. I, I understand your point about it's better if they're shared around, but I thought when you're an hour away from that sort of history, I was hoping that you got there. Yeah, oh, I was devastated after mm. the game. I think it was a, 
There's only two times ever that I've I've cried after um, sport, and and that was one of them. Well, so that's the Port Adelaide loss. Yeah. 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 What was the other one? Um, when I played my last game. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. Unbelievably disappointing losing to Port Adelaide, um, and it still it still haunts me. Not not haunts me, but I, I still think about it to today. So the last game you're referring to about when you shed tears was that the last game with Brisbane or the last game with Essendon? Uh, last game with Essendon. Yeah. Yeah. What did you What did you think of your time at, with the Bombers? Well, I loved my time there. I really I really did. Um, when I left Collingwood and I went to Brisbane. Um, you, you, because I'd only ever been with one AFL club at the time at Collingwood, you just think that all the clubs are kind of the same. Mm. And then um, it, when I got to Brisbane, I realised it was it, they were they're all different. But going back to uh, Melbourne and playing in Essen, at Essendon, um, it was just really good to be back at a at a big club. Mm. Um, and I really enjoy that playing on the big stage with big teams. And there was a view at the time that there'd been this dastardly plot that the Bombers had contrived to get you there. Mm. What actually happened? No, I, I had finished. Um, at the end of 2006, I was 29. Um, I had a few um, things that I was doing outside of footy that I was going to pursue. Um, so I remember having the, the meeting with Lee, saying that I'm going to I'm going to pursue that, um, and I, I was thinking about retiring to do that. And he just said, okay. So within two hours of that meeting, I was in the CEO's office, in Michael Bow's office, signing my release papers, and then. I went on holidays um, and then I got an email from Gary O'Donnell at Essendon um, and he was just congratulating me on my career um, and I replied saying thanks, thanks Gary and then he, he continued with a second email saying we're just seeing what you're doing next year. You played two years there and had 37 games so the games that you were otherwise wouldn't have got. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of people that think there's a juicier plot of how, <laughs> I, of how I got to Essendon, but I can assure you that there was. And I remember at the time when, when all of this was breaking, like people were thinking we colluded. Uh, that's Essendon and myself mm -hmm. and my management, but no, nah, it didn't happen like that. Who would you pick if you're picking your best ever team would you, and you had one spot left and it was Voss or Hurd, who would you pick? <laughs> you could throw Buckley in there too. And Bucks, yeah. Play with Bucks as well. Yeah. Oh, that's a tough question. That's pretty tough. Uh, they got really good characteristics, the three of them, but they're all different. Like Bucks was an, a very good finisher, beautiful skills. Uh, Vossi was a great leader, um, and Hurdy was just uncanny with what he could do. Who was your best coach? I, I really enjoyed Mick Malthouse. And I only had him for one year, so... Yeah, and the Mick was in charge when you left Collingwood, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. I, I, re I really enjoyed Mick, and now that I coach today, I, I take a lot of his philosophies um, of what he instilled back in 2000. I know it's 14 years ago, but there was a lot of good things that he... Like what? What, was the, what were the things, that, the impressions that Mick made on you as a young bloke? It was just a, it was just a real good team manager. Um, managed players... Um, expectations, um, emotions, um, had a genuine care of what you're doing outside football, mm. um, pretty much the whole package. And I remember going around to Mix for dinner and he said, he goes, just, if you can stick it out with me, I, I, I promise you we'll, we will get there. Mick said that, did he? Yeah. It, it was, and that was in 2000? Uh, it was when he first got there, so yeah, it would have been early 2000. Yeah. 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 Did you believe him? Yeah, Because you're coming from a long way back. Yeah, I know, I did believe him, yeah, because yeah. I, I knew that we could only go up. Mm. We, we literally had been at the bottom and, and really struggled, so I knew, I knew that there was going to be some upside, and he had a, a terrific coaching record as well. Mel, lots of famous opponents uh, during your career, probably the most famous, Plugger Lockett. Mm. You actually were on Plugger when he broke the AFL record for goals at the SCG, weren't you? I was. Yeah. They had, they had planned um, for, the, for the record to fall that day. They had fireworks perched on the roof. Um, they had the whole thing. So when he did kick it, yeah, it was like a real carnival atmosphere. You uh, were on the mark. I was on the mark, yeah. Now, he's been quoted as saying that he kicked it terribly, that he was nervous and the ball wobbled. Is, it, is that your recollection? Yeah, I remember standing on the mark and then I turned over my right shoulder and my left shoulder. And you, you could just see the ball and it was almost looked like a leaf in the wind. It was mm. just sort of mm. hovering like that. But it, it stayed true and went, went through for the goal. But yeah, it was an ugly kick, but that was the kick that got the record. And then after that, all hell broke loose. <laughs> <laughs> did, 
you ever engage in any physical encounters with Plugger? With Plugger? Yeah. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly would have. But you were a big boy. I th no. Nothing? No? No, I was still... But then I was I was probably uh, about 88 kilos mm. in, in mm. 99, so he had me by a, a fair bit in terms of the weight division. Um, and he was really aggressive too. Like, I, I did not want to get involved in any <laughs> any kind of physical <laughs> interaction with him. Was he your toughest opponent? He was my toughest opponent that I played on. When he made that ill-fated comeback, you were his opponent again, weren't you? I was, yeah. yeah. Did he look like he wanted to be there? Was it? Was there a diff did you sense a difference in his attitude then? I did. I, I thought he did want to be there. Um, and he, he'd lost a lot of weight. Um, so when he made his comeback, suddenly him and I were on level playing fields. Mm. Um, so, every, so all his strengths that he had against me in the past were, were no longer there. Were you respectful still? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah. What about the other great full forwards that you encountered? Anyone cause you consistent problems? Um, played on a lot of good players um, over the years. I guess the, the ones that really caused me the, the problems were, were the new age forwards, ones that weren't your, your, your standard um, lead from, from the full forward zone. So I look at, um, so Barry Hall was the one that sort of started that. He was just all over the place. Mm. He may not have kicked many goals on me, but he got a lot of possessions because he worked, his work rate was so good. He'd work up to the wing, across to the other wing, back to the, the goal square. And I think a lot of forwards have sort of come out of that mould now. Mel, Vossi went past before and said, hello, Hedgie. Hmm. What was he talking about? <laughs> Um, he was talking about our days in Brisbane where we used to, um, uh, we'd do a couple of midnight pranks, we'd, we'd drive past a couple of the players' houses and some of them had really beautiful hedges at the front. And, <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> and the next bit is, <laughs> took a box of matches out of it. So, Up she go. You were pretty brave taking on Jonathan Brown's hedge, weren't you? Yeah, pretty brave. He, he came out, he wasn't too happy actually. He came out and he was cursing and cussing and by that stage... Um, and you were laughing, sitting at the front, yeah? No, no, myself and my accomplices were already in the car driving down the street. <laughs> just bloke yelling down the road. <laughs> so Brownie just, did he, did he ever see the humour in it? At the time he didn't, he no. was absolutely ropeable. Um, to the point where I think he was saying, if you ever do that again, you know, we're going in the ring. <laughs> Is that right? He was not happy. Yeah. And you didn't do it again? No, I didn't no. do it again. I mean, it's been a great career, there's no doubt about that. I remember watching you play at Collingwood, not sure what was going to become of you, but the, your impact in Brisbane, I mean, you were certainly one of the pillars of that great Brisbane team of 2001 to 2004. Uh, outstanding, you're entitled to be proud of it. You should have been in the team of the year at least once. Well done, good to see you. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.